Yeah, I can hear you now. You just um, there seems to be a delay in the the uh, audio and video Beep. thing, but that might just be because of the video. Okay, I I I can't do a thing about that. I, I just okay. I am so new to all this stuff, but anyway, um, I want to welcome everyone to the water column the premier issue of the experts way in the water column invites you to dive a little deeper into marine creatures and habitats and today's experts are dr jim thomas and dr christine white whose research emphasizes the usually small often overlooked but oh so important amphipods Often known as beach or sand fleas, they are a group of amazingly diverse crustaceans found nearly everywhere in the world's oceans, also in lakes and rivers, and even on land. And today our experts are going to weigh in on video footage of the supergiant amphipods filmed in the waters of the Marianas Trench, the very deepest parts of the world's ocean. Okay, so I was really intrigued when I first saw this video, just because the animals looked so much like your standard line drawing of an amphipod. They just were like so typical to me. Are they really typical? I think they, they're pretty typical. They have the sort I of standard Gamoridian. Are you asking whether the line drawn? I'm sorry, Jim. Our connection must be just awful. I was asking that because they seem so very much like line drawings of Gamoridian yeah. amphipods that I just thought, gosh, these are, these are so typical. Do, are they really a typical Gamoridian amphipod in respects other than Is the fact that they're found? Is your connection better with Chris? Maybe I should let Chris. It, yeah, it is better with Chris. Okay, Chris, you want to address that? Yeah, I think, I mean, they do look like a typical Gamoridian amphipod and they just have this okay. morphology that works. So I think other than being larger, um, pretty much they're, they're exactly the same sort of functional morphology characteristics that typical amphipods have. Awesome. I'm gonna start this video, which was my favorite. Oh, wait, I'm gonna go back. <laughs> I have to put on present here so that you guys can figure out what I'm looking at. Oh, this is not the one I was... This is not the initial video that I was looking at. Okay. Let's well, any video swap of an over. amphipod is a good video. Yeah, I hear you. It is amazing. And I just want to let viewers know, Chris has a wonderful video on why I study amphipods. That is uh, truly truly fun because it's got so many live ones in there but anyway do you see this uh are you guys seeing this uh taping from this uh deep sea researcher that caught both alicella and apparently a number of other amphipods in the hadal zone Was there and a question? Apparently, um, <laughs> yeah, let, let me get to that question because um, 
I, I want to talk about just gigantism in general. I have read several things that indicate that one of the reasons uh, you get this giant size is because there's, ex there's lots of oxygen. Um, I've also read that it helps it metabolize uh, better that, and more efficiently so that the larger they are, that helps with their metabolism and also that it just helps them avoid predation because sometimes they're so big they, they don't fit into the mouth of the predator. So in the case of the giant amphipod, do you guys have a theory as to what you think might be, um, might be going on? Well, a lot of the paracarid crustaceans in that zone are uh, enlarged. You know, the isopods, chumaceans, I mean, a lot of them in that group in that zone uh, reach large sizes. Part of it could be the oxygen. Um, part of it could be the ability to store fat in food stores, and they can actually, you know, if they come upon a, a, a whale fall or some other fall from the surface, they can gorge on it and actually double the size of their body and they store a lot of fat in there. So it's, um, I think that the gigantism is probably a combination. Uh, it's easier uh, to maintain metabolism the larger you are if you're a cold-blooded invertebrate. You can store more food. And if indeed it's an oxygen maxima area, that also can lead to a larger physical body size. So, uh, you know, with the amphipods, they're one of the more numerous groups down there uh, and they're scavengers. So um, I think it would be an advantage to have that larger size and to just to take advantage of food storage, fat storage. And possibly, uh, I'm not sure about the predation not fitting in what's going on in somebody's mouth, but uh, uh, that's certainly an issue, I'm sure. I also uh, read a paper um, that suggested that maybe because of the increased pressure, they would have to repair their DNA more frequently, which would be regulated by growth. So if growth genes were upregulated, maybe it was, it's just a way to be able to repair damage more quickly. Gosh, if there's damage, that means the mutation rate might be increased and, and lead to some of those differences. One of the things, speaking of pressure, one of the things that intrigued me was that I did run into a paper that said um, that because calcium dissolves much more readily at depth, that there was um, actually that there was some kind of aluminum compound that they used to protect the calcium. Can you tell me any more about that? Uh, I can't, but I do know that they use trace metals and, uh, you know, the whole thing, if, if you have an exoskeleton of chitin, you certainly don't want it dissolving away. No. Um, but, but uh, yeah, they're below the area where uh, the compensation or the uh, calcium compensation depth where calcium just goes into a solution. So they have managed to find a way to do that. Um, and most animals, when that happens, it's usually a trace metal. Uh, that they incorporate, okay. but specifically, I don't know. Chris may know more about that. I've just heard the same, that they, they can pull aluminum or cadmium out of the water and sort of um, put it in place of the calcium. Okay. Well, that, uh, that would certainly make a nice, strong exoskeleton. I just thought that was very... Uh, interesting and and because we don't usually think of things that have a calcium exoskeleton having having difficulty maintaining that so anyway I thought that was uh, very interesting anyway I am going to try and move to um, this other video here and um, 
I, I'm going to have to probably move it along before I find the part that has the amphipods. Because this is not the one I pulled initially. Oh, there we go. Okay, are you guys able to see this video? Where, uh, where you have just a... Uh, all I see is a refrigerator. Oh, okay. So you're you're not seeing the video at all. Okay. Let me look. Let me see if I can do that again. Is it going to replace you on the screen? Coming back here. It should. If if all is You could put your amphipod hat on. I could. <laughs> I I have one of those somewhere in storage. I just don't have any clue where it is. And okay. you can scuttle I'm around the room. Hitting the share button. Okay. Are uh, you seeing anything now? Something just yes. happened. Okay. I see. Well. Yes. There we go. Yeah. Okay. You see a net. Okay. Here's the yeah. part. Yeah. About. All right, now, if it would just actually show amphipods, I would be so happy. There. Okay, and do you see just like a swarm of amphipods mm -hmm. on the bait? Yep. And uh, then the yeah, now, super yeah. giant mm -hmm. ones? What? Right. Okay, do you, those are not just little super giants are they there some other species i would there's guess they were different species see. Yeah. yeah i mean there's usually in that group okay. uh there's more I'm than one species and okay we're getting back to that i just wanted to replay that section but there's uh I, I would venture a guess, Leslie, okay, that the that you could you could have a medium sized amphipod, depending on a, if you had a long, uh, large food source that they can enlarge themselves very quickly because that's one of the things they they can do. Uh, so a medium one could go up to a large one with a matter of days just by you know taking on huge amounts of food and then. They would slowly diminish in size as they process that material. If there wasn't anything more for them to keep continue to feeding, feed on. Okay, so that would be a definite advantage for deep sea uh, information. Let me just—I know that um, I'm going to go back to the general meeting here and quit sharing. Okay. Um, and I just kind of want to ask you, uh, what did, what excites you about these really amazing giant amphipods and other large numbers of amphipods in the deep sea? I know you love all amphipods, but was it exciting as a researcher to think about that? Chris, are you there? Go ahead. Just anybody. Okay. okay. No, I think it's, uh, I was working with Jerry Barnard uh, at Smithsonian when a lot of this stuff started to come in back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. Um, uh, they were all within the same family, the Lysianacidae, but, you know, and the only other report of a giant amphipod was one that was made from an albatross that vomited up one on a boat deck that was about 18 inches long, a partial remain. So for a long time, uh, that we, we didn't know. I mean, you know, we didn't know what was going on down there. And this, this bird had obviously picked this thing up. It was an underwater volcanic um, eruption, I guess, and it just kind of parboiled everything at the bottom. And eventually um, this thing ended up at the surface. And I've, 
seen similar things in New Guinea where there's a lot of active volcanoes and these kind of brown slicks with all this deep water stuff that's come up. But when they first started to show up, it was real exciting. And of course, nobody uh, had ever seen one, held one, or do anything. So, yeah, it was nice to know that these things were down there and, and obviously in huge numbers. Um, and of course, it's a, you know, feast or famine down on where they live. Uh, so it's, wasn't unusual and we're still finding new species so the the taxonomy is still evolving in these things but yeah it was exciting to know um i never got to i have a couple in a jar preserved but that's as close as i've gotten to them that i i just the more i did a little research for this discussion the more I was amazed at how many amphipods are actually down there in the Hadal zone. I mean, just a tremendous number of species, as well as just large numbers. And uh, below 6,000 feet, they seem to dominate the, the crustacean fauna anyway. So, um, yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting. Well, um, yeah. But uh, and the advantage keep going. The advantage they have, well, the advantage they have over some of the other uh, big crustaceans down there, like the isopod bathynomius, is the amphipods are much more modal. They can move around very quickly, swim, and get to where they're going. And basically, the isopods are just kind of, I think, kind of scratching around on the bottom. Uh, they're not good swimmers, uh, but they do they do the same thing. They're all scavengers and opportunists. Um, so, well, you know, when you're down I, at those depths, one thing, if you drop a big hunk of fish down anything. there, you're going to see isopods and amphipods. Yeah. Well, I think also the fact that they brood the young must be a tremendous advantage for living at depth that... They don't have to have a planktonic phase. Nobody has to come up to the surface and then make it back down. <laughs> so um, anyway, I just have really Yeah, that would be a this. problem. Yeah, it would. <laughs> uh, but anyway, thank you so much for joining me in this, my premier edition of The Expert's Way In. And uh, I really do appreciate your participation and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Well, you thank you for having us, Leslie. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. All righty, yep, bye-bye.